across the galaxy. This is where conspiracy on the wild side meets the perspective of a lifetime. This is the Free Zone with your host, Freeman. Hello and welcome to the Free Zone. It's wonderful again to have you all here tuning in every week here on FreemanTV.com where we are seeking to understand how this culture is degrading and what are the motives and operandi that are causing all of these situations to dispel the very culture that is humanity's birthright. Now, Aldous Huxley left us with a bit of a warning inside of Brave New World, telling us everybody is happy now. And as we look at our world today, and we see we have abortion, we have cloning, we have... uh, same-sex marriages, we have diversity coming out and strip malls going everywhere, it seems that we are walking straight into a brave new world. I mean, my God, we even have a pharmaceutical called Soma. And as we watch the culture digress, we see that it is this diversity that is destroying the culture. And behind all of these dark roots, we're going to find the occult. We're going to find tales of science fiction that have become reality. And to bring this story alive for us is David Livingstone. He has been researching the hidden aspects of history for the last 25 years, resulting in numerous books, which include Transhumanism, A History of a Dangerous Idea, Black Terror, White Soldiers, Islam, Fascism, and the New Age, and getting into terrorism and the Illuminati, a 3,000 year history. This author is gonna bring us rigorous scholarly work that unveils the secrets behind this new culture creation. So welcome to the show, David. It's so wonderful to have you here. Thanks, it's an honor to be here. Well, I uh, want to wax a little philosophical with you at first and discuss this idea of everybody is happy now. We need to understand the perils of happiness and how diversity will actually destroy culture and therefore destroy our very way of existence. Yeah. So let's start there. What, where are the perils of happiness? What was Aldous Huxley really warning us about? And you know, how is it that strip malls become the, the doom cry of civilization? Um. That's a, that's a big question. <laughs> it is. It is. I got to say, we're going to wax philosophical for a bit sure, just to kind of set the stage here Okay. as we're well, going to get deeper. I mean, Huxley doesn't provide a warning, right? He, he provides a blueprint that is masked as a warning. So Brave New World is the blueprint that was followed by the CIA after World War II. Um, and just like pretty much like... Uh, Orwell, who was a student of Huxley, his book as well is masked as a warning. Um, so the kind of happiness I think he's Huxley is talking about is delusion, right? So um, self-denial, a kind of uh, people managing to convince people that they're happy. Um, it's not something you can actually ever accomplish because people deep down somehow know they're not happy but uh still i guess in their more conscious level they get it's it's possible i guess to get people to at least possible to get people pursuing certain things which they think will help them achieve happiness yeah so i think that's that's the world that we're living in you know it's a post-christian world where then it's easy to provide uh, false idols, and they've come of all kinds. So when people are uh, basically um, removed from the truth, and then it, and when they go chasing after uh, the truth, which is really away from the truth, it's pop- it's basically very easy then to delude people, and you can provide. Uh, you know, thousands of different ways of um, of diluting them, because really, in the end, what it comes down to is control. And I think that that's the kind of thing that Huxley was after. These, the, you know, fundamentally, as an Gnostic, what he believes is that um, is that there is no God. So all that matters is 
what Nietzsche uh, would have described as triumph of the will. So all that matters is basically yourself and your your supremacy over others. And so according to Gnostic beliefs, there there are the few who are able to to supposedly accept the truth that there is no truth, and they believe on that basis that they are then entitled to re, to delude or lead the the rest of the masses who are too um, too inferior, too too weak to to face the the consequences. Yes. So, I think, uh, yeah, I think that's basically what it comes down to. Yeah, and honestly, if you were to ask a Satanist in their belief system, that would be it. Yeah. Yeah, I, without a doubt. So as we start to look at this puzzle and we start to see how we got to where we're coming, you've managed to channel the hippies' 60s freedom movement and relegate it over to the side of the dark occult. Yeah, definitely. So let's you know, discuss. Yeah. Oh, go ahead. Sure. I mean, so so the hippies is a classic example of that false happiness, right? It's a, in fact, I mean, that's that, that, this is what the devil promises in Garden of Eden is is freedom. So it's always been it's always been the lie of the occult is that, you know, we as as human beings, we we have an inherent sense of right and wrong. So we have a conscience that battles between temptation and. Uh, a desire to to do what's right, so we're in a constant we're in a constant struggle, and you can never escape that struggle. So and it's and it's challenging, it's it's difficult to deal with. <laughs> yes, it's a constant struggle everyday life. I mean, our lives can be complicated with family, children, and job, all kinds of obligation. We have a constant uh, struggle to determine what's right. So for for people who aren't able to put that into perspective. Basically, what the occult does is it offers what appears to be an escape from that struggle. It basically convinces you that that struggle is in your mind. That struggle, you're dealing with um, doubts or um, expectations that are imposed on you by society. And ultimately, the Gnostics would say that those are false values that are imposed by a uh, a, a false god, because they equate the god of the Bible with a false god. So all the all the all the normal laws that that are part of our existence, like decency, uh, politeness, uh, compassion, care, uh, the diligence, uh, you know, on and on and on. All those are then presented as being the figment of somebody's imagination. That hey, you know, you actually don't have a responsibility towards anybody or anything except yourself, because in the end, there are no consequences, so you can actually do what you want. All those things that you were tempted to do, no matter how vile, you can actually just go right ahead, because it doesn't matter in the end. So, so to understand, I think, you know, the, the 60s, that's, this, this is, of course, an occult agenda that goes back thousands of years, but I, it seems like it was really only in the 60s that they were able to have and the success to such an extent that they were able to transform the whole culture. Because, you know, basically, if you look at West, pretty much North American culture and maybe even Western culture, except for except for the French and American revolutions, the '60s is pretty much one of the most important transformations. I mean, we have we can we, we live in a completely diametrical moral landscape than we did to uh, prior to the '60s. Right, like I tell my kids, it's like, you know, my, my, my parents' generation, everybody went to church when they were kids. And I'm not going to say, insist that Christianity is necessarily the truth. I'm just going to just I'm mention it by comparison, that the 60s was able to upturn so many basic values that were held uh, prior to that and, and open. They basically created um, a, a perspective, like a vista, basically. They opened up. They opened up the, the possibility that everything can be questioned, right? So there's no more everything that well, whatever was considered truth in the past was some kind of uh, prejudicial, uh, chauvinistic, uh, narrow-minded uh, confine. Whereas now, you know, we, we talked about transgenderism, so that's a prime example of you know, and homosexuality is going on and on, and drug use, of course. Everything can be reconsidered. Every, anything 
potentially that was considered wrong before could, could actually could maybe be right. And I think this does, this takes us so f- as far as pedophilia. And ironically, it's pedophilia. It's it's the it's pedophiles essentially who who really opened the way for this kind of value transformation because it's it seems to be that that's the ultimate uh, jewel in their crown that they're after. That's the ultimate uh, uh, value that they're or or the, the suppressed moral. The, the suppressed value that they're actually trying to to overturn. Um, the, the person who is really responsible, there's a lot of, there's a few people, a, a short list of people who are largely responsible for the sexual revolution, because that's really what the 60s were, a combination with drugs, were William Reich, uh, Margaret Mead, and most importantly, Alfred Casey. So Alfred Casey, of course, happened to be a devoted follower of Aleister Crowley. He uh, teamed up with uh, Kenneth Anger, who uh, helped to found the Church of Satan with Anton LaVey. And Kenneth Anger was pretty much the central figure in the Laurel Canyon scene, out of which the 60s rock and roll or folk rock uh, culture emerged. So, uh, you know, the, 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 the ultimate real value that they are after that they protect is is the concept of pedophilia, and really this goes back to occult ritual, because the the most important aspect of of occult ritual has always been you go back six thousand years has always been child sacrifice, and why what I why what I'm relating here is the idea that the the idea of of uh, of committing uh, moral crimes against a child is sort of the ultimate symbol of a rejection of God. Yeah, we can absolutely see this, David. When hashtag love one hit the Twitter feed and same-sex marriages was made a national, you know, they had a White House painted in rainbow, uh, the very next day, the pedophiles were coming forward saying, you know, it's our turn. It's our turn, yeah. Yeah, it's really, really... We are definitely seeing this. When you look at the early stages of Hollywood, you brought up Kenneth Anger and yeah. his uh, Luciferian films. Uh, the very early days of Hollywood, they were doing nothing but promoting Satanist in front of us. Many people don't realize that Elvis actually was a theosophist, a Luciferian, and practicing occult rituals. They yeah. don't know that Sammy Davis Jr. was a card-carrying member of the Church of Satan. <laughs> You know, yeah. all of the people you saw up on stage, Fred Astaire, all of them, they just had connections to these dark occult roots in early Hollywood, and they were creating these icons that had been uh, placed in front of everyone due to the 60s revolution. Absolutely. I mean, you really, you look at the 60s, I mean, sorry, uh, Hollywood culture, and it's it has no other purpose, really. It, you know, sometimes it'll f- support American foreign policy, but really, ultimately, what it's uh, designed to do is upturn traditional values. And it's been, it's been doing that since inception. We've gone from everybody being upset with Elvis shaking his hips to right. Lady Gaga performing full blood rituals under burning Luciferian angels yeah. on, uh, you know, uh, primetime television. Yeah, or Miley Cyrus in naked in a video. Absolutely. I mean, my, and, and some of this becomes so obvious. I'm sorry. Uh, but like Miley, I mean, her first video as Miley Cyrus coming forward is as a fallen angel with her black wings in a cage saying, yeah. you can't tame this. You can't change this. You can't save me. You can't stop me. And this is the message that they're putting in all the children. Yeah, I, I, I really worry about Miley Cyrus. So I guess everybody does. But it's obvious that, uh, you know, when, when you look at the beliefs of their parents, it's it's uh, it's horrifying to imagine what kind of childhoods they must have gone through. And Walt Disney Co. I don't know if you go there or not. I haven't heard you mention them, but boy, are they at the heart of most of this satanic programming? Yes, I fully agree. Fully agree. You know, I, I, this brings up an uh, an example that I often give, and and Disneyland is a prime example. But this is what I tell to my kids. <clears throat> you know, sometimes when they. Uh, there's certain movies they want to watch, and I tell them, you know, how many bad messages there are in them. And they say, but it's a good movie. And I say, yeah, of course it's a good movie. Yeah. <laughs> you know, that's the point. You know, it's like 
if you look at the story of Hansel and Gretel, how does she attract the kids? Right? She makes just this fantastic splendor of a of a house covered in candy. You know, if it was a modern day house, you should have Xbox in there, and you know, it would be it's a pleasure palace for kids, right? That's the idea. Of course, that's the thing is that Satanism for children is typically not. Um, it's not as dark as and, and and creepy or eerie as as you would normally expect Satanism to present itself. It presents itself in a very very benign way. Right? That's the that's the strategy. Absolutely. So, totally. so Disney is a prime example of uh, of uh, candy coated Satanism. Without a doubt, you know, there's tales like Tangled, uh, the movie they put out, where it teaches the children that your mother is actually an evil witch sucking your energy. And that you actually are a princess and should be able to go run off with a, a thief. Yeah. And, 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 you know, people are looking for subliminal messages in this stuff. You don't have to look. It's right there in the storyline, yeah. folks. I mean, just the fact that, you know, most of the first Disney stories all, were all grim stories. They, mm -hmm. They're all cult stories from Snow White, Sleeping Beauty, uh, Cinderella, on and on and on. They're all cult stories. Fundamentally, like, you know, it's right out in the open. Absolutely. And as we're in this genre right now discussing this, I was going to go to neo-paganism and get back to the beginning and the roots of this, but we're in the idea of media right now. And I, uh, I know you had some stuff to say about comic books. Now, yeah. to set this stage, we just recently, well, in 2000, 15 years ago, we had the death of Superman and the breaking of Batman. And yeah. we find that Superman pretty much becomes non-existent at this point. And Hellspawn, a comic book by Todd McFarlane put out by Image Comics, becomes yeah. the new Superman. Right. And Hellspawn, his first villain is a pedophile. And yeah. he is a satanic warrior uh, killing bad guys to fill the ranks of Satan's army, right? Mm -hmm. And this is your new superhero that took over for Superman. Or you have the breaking of Batman. And when, Bre when Bruce Wayne gets destroyed in that uh, series, he is replaced by a character known as Azrael, which, of right. course, is the fallen angel in the Book of Enoch. Uh, so let's talk a little bit more about media here, uh, and then we'll get back to the neo-paganism. But the ideas inside of comic books, I know you had some thoughts on that. Yeah, so, you know, there's... Um, well, we, you know, you mentioned earlier you'd like to broach the subject of discordianism. So I'm just going to mention it because it's an example of the kind of twisted culture that emerges to the surface from occult influence. Yes, that's so, that's a good place. Yeah. Yeah. So so comic books is very much the same thing. It's 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 a uh, there it's it's a it's a product. It's a cultural product of a corrupt, deviant mentality. So. It's been brought to the point now where, you know, the irony is that comic books were in trouble. Uh, I don't know how many, maybe a decade or a couple of decades ago, until um, until they basically they resurrected them with this this slew of movies that they've been coming out with. So it's too bad because <laughs> I would have liked to see them gone. You know, I but I just think that superheroes just <laughs> it's it's uh, really just such a pathetic silly concept i just can't believe you know it really bothers me when i see even my own kids getting interested in that stuff because it's just the most ridiculous idea you know the, the idea of this guy with superhuman powers prancing around and you know uh, spandex and you know the, the 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 portrayal of women with these enormous breasts and cleavage and you know the, the whole culture is really a culture of perversion and and petty so, you know, aspirations, pet, really a petty, uh, debased uh, uh, perception of, of, of human beings. So, you know, ironically, I, I start my book about comic book, I start the chapter in my book about comic book culture with, um, with uh, um, uh, Aldous Huxley, as well as J.H.G. Wells, because there's, there's a thread here that runs... There's an underlying thread in occult influence, which ties seems to tie, tie in directly to science fiction, right from the beginning, right? So, you know, uh, probably H.G. Wells was probably the head of Illuminati in his time. And this is complete speculation on my part. I mean, it may be su succeeded by Aldous Huxley is what I would suspect. 
but uh, a science fiction writer. Before him was Edward Bulwer-Lytton, who in his time was the head of Illuminati. He was the head of the Rosicrucian Order. He was really the the figure of the late uh, of the occult revival of nineteen of the nineteen late nineteenth century, and uh, which is basically a role that was uh, he was succeeded in by first H.G. Wells and then Aldous Huxley. So all three of them science fiction writers. So for some reason, this this idea of of uh, of a of a of a future a future world dominated by advanced science, some kind of version of advanced science has been an underlying theme in um, occult versions of history. So, so comic books really come out of that same world. You know the 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 beginning of comic book culture, and I'm not an expert on this. Is just something I've researched. I, I could do a lot more research in it to to have a better understanding of it. But from from what I've been able to gather, really emerges out of uh, uh, early Pulp Fiction, like uh, Weird Tales, which is a magazine that featured people like um, uh, Robert is it Robert E. Howard. He created uh, uh, Conan the Barbarian, uh, and he was a member of the Lovecraft Circle. So really, the key personality, the the key influence in this in the entire penetration of occult influence in comic book culture is H.P. Lovecraft. Again, a theosophist. So in his old idea of the old ones and so on and so forth, basically that's just the fallen angels and, you know, different, uh, under a different name. And uh, um, that's the culture, that's the early sort of pop, trashy occult uh, pop culture that produced the superheroes. And the creators of, of Superman were, um, I'm going to say they were Jewish, not that that, incriminates them necessarily, but particularly they were occult-oriented Jews. And so the idea of Superman, first of all, uh, derives from Nietzsche's Ubermensch, which is really one of the most key, important uh, occult concepts in modern times. It really very much guides the entire mission of the Illuminati in modern times. And then secondly, uh, this is not my own theory, but you look at numerous historians of comic books, and they will clearly identify that even the idea of Superman's mission of fighting, quote-unquote, injustice, is actually the idea of what's called Tikkun. And Tikkun, T-I-K-K-U-N, is a Kabbalistic idea derived specifically from the Kabbalah of Isaac Luria. So that really is the kernel of, of everything that I've been presenting in all my books, is, is the idea that what we are experiencing right in, in our time continues to be a mission which was incepted. It goes first further back all the way to Babylon in the 6th century BC, but in more recent times, it represents the Kabbalah of Isaac Luria. And he's a rabbi, a famous rabbi of the, um, of the 16th century from Palestine. And he created what's called, uh, it's normally called Lurianic Kabbalah or New Kabbalah. And uh, and he created, basically, he really set the tone for, he, he he articulated the philosophy that's been adopted by Illuminati, and it's been it's been uh, reinterpreted in a different language. Most importantly, the the, the two key people were Jacob Burma, uh, who basically gave it a Christian a veneer, and then following him was Hegel. Hegel basically took the concepts of Jacob Burma and gave it a new coloring. Then, of course, from there, you have Marx, who developed out of Hegel, and so on and so forth. So, you know, modern culture in the last 150 years, even 200 years, has been, the power culture, let's say more specifically, has been almost entirely Hegelian. So to give, so, you know, so what I've been following, basically, is how how this idea from Lurianic Kabbalah has been preserved through the centuries from some of the Sabbatians, the Rosicrucians, the Freemasons, the Illuminati, the Asiatic Brethren, the Golden Dawn, Alistair Crowley, and into our time, and even, you know, the Frankfurt School and so on. I think so, Madonna did a ritual at his grave. Uh, who's? Uh, it's Gloria. Yeah. There you go. Exactly. Yeah, so to, to, to wrap up, basically, the idea of the superhero, beginning with Superman. Interestingly, Superman began, before he was renamed as Superman, began, began as a character uh, named Dr. Occult. 
<laughs> yeah, absolutely. Wow. But, and yeah. then they basically decided to transfer everything into Superman. Wow. And now we have Obama running around saying that he's uh, Superman, born of Kal El, and yeah. uh, <laughs> you know his father Jor El. Of and course. Yeah, you, you can see. Uh, you know, even on the the CIA TV series Chuck, they make jokes about Stan Lee. Uh, right. being in the CIA. Oh, they do. Right? Interesting. Yeah, they, they, you know, they're letting this stuff... Well, there's a lot of CIA programming going on for children right now. It's a spy culture for sure. Spy Kids yeah. is definitely on the rise. And yeah. the amount of CIA television that we see, like Alias or uh, Fringe or Chuck, you know, or you know, Covert Affairs, I could probably list a number of them that are all straight from the CIA coming out to us and right. going straight to the children, of course. Absolutely, yeah. So that without a doubt. So this this goes back to Satan light, though. Uh, as we start to get to this puzzle, as you showed, they have uh, somewhat culturized the Satanism, and now it kind of came out as Satan light, where people didn't notice they were they were being brought into a satanic belief system with neo paganism and chaos magic. Yeah, in a new age. Right, I mean, the New Age is the is, is really the most um, what's the word? The most uh, it's the light of light, right? Right, it's their highest goal. It's, it's it's really well. The New Age is really the the most um, benign or watered down uh, version of the New Age. Really, in people's mind, basically represents the opposite of what they imagine Satanism to be. Right, right. Right. It's all sort of hippy dippy, happy, happy meditation, lots of love, lots of hugging, you know, but ultimately what it is, it's, it, it is, it, it is Satanism. It's this, it's the way that Satanism has been marketed. And this came up through LSD culture. Right. And I mean, that's, that's an interesting story right there. If, if we want to go, and start to look into this LSD culture and how it, uh, you know, Timothy Leary up to uh, Ted Kaczynski. Yeah. Let's let's talk about that. Yeah. Um, well, to backtrack, I mean, the psychedelic drugs is is a fascinating idea itself, right? So, like like I trace in my book is that. Um, the drugs, some kind of psychedelic, seems to have been part of a cult ritual or the ancient mysteries going back thousands of years. So basically, there's there's two types of what are, are what is called a spiritual experience, and so the normal spiritual experience is a purely rational experience, right? It's like you you look at a sunset, it's fantastic. You realize that it's a it's it's the uh, it was it's created so you realize that there's a creator behind it you realize that the creator is is sublime and so that awe that you feel that's a normal rational uh spiritual experience then you have this other kind of basically what i call a counterfeit spiritual experience and that's what that's what mysticism is because mysticism basically is trickery it's it's um it's a sleight of hand to 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 uh to create the impression of something miraculous. And there's many ways you can do it. So, you know, that's why in the cult rituals, and really this is why, um, I'm not sure what your belief is on this, but basically uh, when people take part in magic, because it, I believe that magic does happen, I believe that it, it, it operates under laws, physical laws that we haven't yet uh, identified or at least popularly identified. So, because because it creates because it it, it the, the the performance of it appears to be something like a miracle. There's this misconception that it's spiritual, and the idea that it's it's breaking the laws of nature that it so that the the magician uh, exercises powers that allows him to break the laws of nature, and because. God is the only one who's normally able to do that. So then the magician is godlike. And this is the arrogance, this is the pretense that uh, magicians operate under. And this is why it goes back, uh, you know, thousands of years from the beginning, even the lie that Satan tells to Adam and even the garden is that you shall be as gods. And so to Gnostics, 
They believe that Satan taught human beings magic, which allows them to be gods. And this idea leads all the way up to modern times and is articulated very clearly in Dan Brown's uh, The Lost Symbol, just to, to ensure that I'm not just uh, you know, speculating on this idea. So, uh, so another way... So, you know, you basically, if these people experience spirits or the spirits, disembodied uh, entities will convince them that they are gods or they'll perform actions which will convince uh, mystics that they are gods. And drugs seem to be another way of creating this, you know, so-called mystical or spiritual experience. So this is why when you look at all this, in fact, it begins with William James before all this Huxley. William James who was a very important uh, figure. Um, he's connected to everybody, but I haven't been able to connect him. He, I guess he belonged to the Theosophical Society as well. He was the head of basically like the leading American psychologist of the turn of the 19th century. And, um, but he's the one who put forward this idea of a religious experience. And he's, so he's pretty much considered the, the, the idea of, who founded the scholarly study of religious experience, but he's also the one who confused the idea of religious experience. So he he experimented with nitrous oxide, which is laughing gas, and uh, he had, which is amazing, we can't imagine in our time how somebody could have what they would imagine to be a mystical experience with laughing gas. And if you ever heard of the trick that you can use um, uh, the cream whip cans and you, there's nitrous oxide in there, so something as, as ridiculous as using something like that to produce a religious experience, but this is the, this is the mistake that they, that they fall into. So he believed essentially that drugs, and this is where he really incepted this confusion, that drugs could produce a religious experience. In his case, it was nitrous oxide. And then the whole uh, tradition of experimentation started out of that. So if you know like Aldous Huxley, his, not Aldous Huxley, sorry, um, Alice Crowley, he wrote A Diary of a Drug Fiend, which basically uh, chronicled his experimentation with all kinds of stuff. And again, this was an attempt to, in his mind, try to achieve uh, mystical states. And then, I, this was also an interpretation of what they thought was a practice that had been uh, done for thousands of years by the mystics before them. So Aldous Huxley... When he names the drug in his book, um, uh, Brave New World, when he names the drug that's used to delude the masses, Soma, is because he's a very knowledgeable guy. And Soma is a Soma is the drug that was supposedly that's mentioned in the Vedas that was supposedly used by the ancient um, uh, well before them the Magi. There's, there's the, the drug goes by two names that are kind of interchangeable. There's Soma and Halma. So the ancient Babylonian Magi were, had supposedly used the Soma to achieve mystical states. So the irony here is that Huxley, and this is why I say that his book is not a warning but a blueprint. He, the drug is called Soma, but is used, is supposedly, uh, is supposed to take you, to help you achieve a mystical state, but at the same time, it's the drug used to control you. <laughs> So which is it, right? This is the happiness he's talking about. What kind of happiness are, are you talking about? Are you saying that people are happy when they're deluded and, and uh, all tripped out and completely disconnected with reality so that they, that's what happiness is? That's your idea of happiness? And I think that's, so is, is the idea of people lost in a false idea of spiritual experience, is that control and i think that that's what it ultimately comes down to so i think what they guys are doing is they're using drugs to fool people into thinking that they've achieved mystical states as a form of self-delusion as a form of false happiness and ultimately as a form of control here here absolutely well, the Church of Subgenius tells us uh, with Bob Dobbs that slack is the answer and exactly. that the pinkies are out there taking our slack. Yeah. How does this relate into Islam? And, and we're looking at a strange puzzle here as they start to 
infiltrate our culture with with muslims <laughs> and i hate to say it like that but it definitely if you're looking at france you're looking at, at europe we're seeing this infiltration and i know there's a connection here with all of this type of stuff from the discordians church of subgenius to the the moore's church right um complicated question <laughs> yeah <laughs> well i mean we're, we're in a new to go back to isaac luria because Isaac Luria is basically, it's out of his philosophy that the Illuminati developed the idea of a Hegelian dialectic. Because a Hegelian dialectic is basically, uh, it's, it's, it's Hegel's version of the Kabbalistic dialectic. And it's the belief that, uh, I mean, to simplify it, it's a belief that you can use two opposing uh, ideologies to, to lead people into, uh, into a designated ideology. So you create... You create a, a thesis, and then you create its antithesis. So basically, you create one stupid idea, and then you create another, uh, even more stupid idea, until and you convince people to realize that uh, both of them are stupid. So obviously, the solution is the one that you're going to uh, suggest to them. So this is how we have the left and right, left and right politics, or you know, Democrats and conservatives, uh, secularists and theologists, uh, fundamentalists and secularists. This is this is how this is how ever since the the coup d'état the Illuminati in 1789 this is the world that we operate under with their control of the media this is how they feed us so we're constantly being fed these dialectics which are really designed to manipulate us and you know conspiracy culture is one of the worst most corrupted examples of the exploitation of the dialectic and you know there there's there's little bits of truth and conspiracy culture, but for the most part, from what I see, it's entirely manufactured and, and manipulated. Let's the, talk let's about talk that about a little that. bit. Yeah. yeah. The, so, uh, we call that chicken little programming, and I think Disney outlined it very well uh, when they put out the original version of Chicken Little and the yeah. idea of feeding psychology into a voice of the people that goes around and then spreads that fear and uh, then guides everybody into the fox's den. Yeah. Um, you know, I've talked about this before. I think I talked about Jan Irwin. It's the idea of that 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 um, MO is revealed in Orwell's 1984, right? So you you disseminate a book which purportedly exposes the conspiracy, and then when which allows you to, to identify those who are clever enough to pick up on it, right? right. So so Winston, who is the lead, who is the main character of 1984. He's provided the, the, it's called the book. He's provided the book by a member of the party who poses as a dissident. Now, how many times has that happened, right? That makes me think of Richard Doty and the UFO movement, MJ-12 documents and so on and so forth. But anyway, so we, we, we don't know exactly what uh, O'Brien's position is in the party, but he seems to be like a particularly important figure. So it's the leader of the party himself who who puts out this book, which supposedly exposes the conspiracy. So I've written an article recently, which, which details my findings, which I uh, outline in my book, Black Terror, White Soldiers, about the creation of the protocols, the protocols of Zion. Well, let me tell the folks here that they can find your work at conspiracyschool.com. That's conspiracyschool.com. I just want them to be able to find all of that. Thanks. Yeah, so it's an article I put together only a few weeks ago, but it's, it's in more detail in my book. And basically, if you look at all the organizations that were, the people and the organizations that were involved in the revelation, so-called quote-unquote revelation of the protocols, and people get upset with me because then they think, oh, you know, it's, it's true, you know, they're correct, they're very accurate. I'm like, yeah, probably they are to a great extent. I think they are, but in fact, into my mind, the protocols only give you a tiny part of the story. You know they're they're an important clue, but they're, they're obviously not revealing the the depth of the of the conspiracy. It's sort of like a, you know, it's, it's like a science kind of a science fiction version of the Illuminati. Oh, you know? really? It's like a a fairy tale version of the Illuminati. So it, it's the Order of Zion in there, the the Rite of Memphis Miserium, even the lady herself, uh, Juliana Glinka, who provided the the protocols to. To Nihilus, Sergei Nihilus, who was the guy who first translated them, or translated, sorry, Marzins, Sergei Nihilus, the Russian who first exposed the protocols, 
she herself was a follower, a direct follower of H.P. Blavatsky, as well as a working Russian agent of the Okhrana. This entire nest of of um, of creeps that I that I expose in uh, in my book. So that gives you the groundwork of the protocols. Then, what's the most important instance of their use was towards the rise of the Nazi regime. So right. the whole, uh, the whole I, I mean, you know, that's, it's, it's what's called a warrant for genocide, right? This is what, this is what their, the Illuminati plan was, was to, was to build up the Nazis, who basically were all followers of Blavatsky. They were early proto-New Age followers, you know, thorough occultists, um, and uh, to basically to use the Jewish people as a scapegoat you know the pro so so Hitler uses the protocols to basically identify the quote the, the crimes of the so-called uh, Jewish powers, but then he goes and rounds up all the bakers and shoemakers and uh, right. the street sweepers, and all his money is coming from the same uh, you know the Rockefellers, the Schiffs, the you know the Warburgs and so on and so forth are funding people who are supposedly identified in the protocols. So how does that make sense, right? So right. obviously. It's it's the it's the masses are the not only the masses but it's the people who are willing to suspect that something is going wrong who are the first to be deluded, right? right. The people the people that Hitler manipulated were the ones who said, "Hey, is this something is something is hidden here." You know, the media is controlled. That this we're being lied to, and you know what? It's the Jews that are. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Every time you're pointing a finger, you, you should know that you're on the wrong path. So, you know, it wasn't just the regular German. It was the, it was those Germans. It was all the, the equivalents of the Winstons in Orwell's 1984. All those who were astute enough to recognize that something deeper, more sinister is happening. They're the first ones to get caught. So when you look at conspiracy culture in the United States, ironically, it's the because the key aspect of this of the story of the 20th century is the pretended defeat of the Nazis uh, after or for during World War II, and then their recruitment to the CIA. Right. So you look at the the, uh, at the top personnel of the CIA in, in the first portion of the Cold War it was all Nazis. Right. Uh, Reinhard Galen headed the the um, the Western Intelligence Arm or of Eastern, whatever. Anyway, Martin Hart Galen was a key person in, in the intelligence apparatus of the CIA after World War I. Uh, the, you know, the, the, the leading uh, um, trainer of most of the uh, terrorists and thugs employed by the CIA. Oh, we lost it again. Well, folks, we are continually having problems with Skype here, and I, I find it uh, uh, amazing because I don't know if you folks know this, but when you sign in to Skype for the very first time, uh, the very first message that you get on your Skype is a quote from 1984 where uh, O'Brien is discussing the reality of Big Brother. Really? Yeah. <laughs> if it, I don't know if you can go all the way back into your uh, history or not, but if you look at the very first message in Skype, it will be O'Brien telling you Big Brother is real. Oh, wow. And I find you, David, to have many Skype issues. It's true. <laughs> it's a coincidence. Yeah. Yeah. We never know, do we? Because we are spreading light here. We are trying to uncover this whole thing. And I'll tell you, I've been caught up in this without a doubt. I've had my relationships with uh, Discordianism and I've had my relationships with Robert Heinlein and the Church of All Worlds. Uh, I, I've gone out to Rainbow and what, what Robert Anton Wilson would probably call temporary autonomous zones. Oh, really? And okay. I, I've sought this this type of mentality and found favor inside of things like the Church of All Worlds. Now, you kind of surprised me because I did not know Heinlein had any connection with the Ordo Templi Orientis. Oh, yeah. Can you tell me about that? Um, yeah, I don't know a lot of the details about his involvement, but uh, he, he was a key member of the OTO, and he was part of a circle that included... Um, well, he was part of the Laura Canyon team. 
Wow. Uh, with uh, Jack Parsons. He used to hold these various beams. Again, this is the thread that I was talking about, about science fiction. It, it, seems, it seems to be, uh, you know, our running thing. So from, you know, very important. In fact, I just read the other day that um, Arthur C. Clarke was, was with the CIA. Well, so much of our technology comes from the occult, and you've now connected Heinlein uh, with Jack Parsons and bringing this story to, well, modern rocketry and our, our current state of affairs in the 21st century. So we're going to start to lead this from this uh, psychedelic occult movement, uh, which, as we have found, consistently goes back to theosophy, which I find very intriguing. And if you want to mention any more on that, because that seems to continually come up as we get to the heart of things. And I don't think most people even know about theosophy. Right. And then how this this theosophical relationship with uh, relative moral, moral morality is leading to this virtual reality, which is going to have this no consequence scenario leading us into transhumanism. So as we wrap up this first hour here, let's let's just take this final piece of the puzzle from Theosophy, Jack Parsons. <laughs> you know, if we can tie those together, I don't know. Of course, we have the Nazis right in there, and yeah. uh, bring this straight up to where they're what they're calling the Great Work. Yeah. Um, you mean you want to start the new thread, the new half now, or? No, let's let's finalize this one, folks. We we've had a ton of technical errors on this, and it's you know it's just the way it goes when you start to speak truth on on Big Brother's devices. I hate to be that kind of paranoia, but you know I've never had this much trouble, David, with the show. Oh, yeah. That's funny. And, Sorry to hear that. <laughs> yeah, I know, but we're laying it down, you know, and that's what the world needs. They need to understand these layers because Satanism light is absolutely the modus operandi right now. And, you know, as we're showing the folks over and over again, that it's it's just right there in our in our culture that is being created through the media, the comic books, the news, and as we have shown, even through truthers. Uh, so... I just wanted to, to kind of bring about a conclusion to this uh, side of it, as we've been kind of looking all the way back to ancient alchemy, uh, yeah. the magic of the Sumerians coming all the way forward into theosophy and up to Jack Parsons and modern rocketry, and now we're in a world where uh, we're about to have cloning and transhumanism, and uh, you know this is their dream. This is their great work. And so just to lead us into that, uh, any final thoughts you have on how this psychedelic movement can turn into such a uh, computerized prison? Um, I'd like to mention uh, what I think is going to tie up what we just said and then lead into what we're probably going to start talking about. So, uh, because when you mentioned Blavatsky, so she was a mystic of the late um, 19th century. Uh, that's a period or a leading figure was called uh, the occult revival. As I mentioned earlier, uh, the most important person of the time was uh, Edward Bulwer Lytton. Uh, but uh, so he kind of set the stage, and uh, she then really became the leading light of that period. This is where you get an explosion of occult orders, most importantly, the Golden Dawn, so on and so forth, that Alistair Crowley came out of. Uh, but and they were largely inspired by the ideas of, of uh, H.P. Blavatsky who happened to be both a Russian and a uh, British agent. Uh, that ties us back into the protocols that we were talking about. So her idea, where one of the areas where it, she's very important, uh, first of all, um, she claimed to have been in contact with what she called ascended masters. So basically these were disembodied uh, entities uh, that used to, to communicate with her one way or the other. And at first, she identified Egypt as the source of the ancient wisdom. And that's when she was originally in contact with uh, Egyptian masons that uh, created the fundamentalist, uh, Islamic fundamentalist uh, tradition called a Salafism, which is really the origin of ISIS uh, today. Um, and then after that, she moved to India. And that's when she started to identify uh, Tibet more specifically 
as the source of ancient wisdom. What she believed is that fallen angels <coughs> descended um, uh, ancient times, descended to Earth. Uh, led, they were led by what she calls Sanakumar, and she identified them as being the same as Satan. And they set up what's called the Great White Brotherhood in a uh, realm called Shabala. And um, from there, they were supposedly guiding the evolution of uh, humanity. So from their influence, you get the Aryan race. And from the Aryan race, you get uh, their influence spread throughout uh, Central Asia, Northern India, and Europe. And the most pronounced example of their influence was, first of all, uh, shamanism, and most specifically, uh, bond shamanism. So what happens is that um, bond shamanism then gets mixed in with Hindu Tantra and Buddhism to create Tibetan Buddhism. So there's a false perception out there that Tibetan Buddhism, first of all, the worst mistake is to assume that the Dalai Lama is a holy man. But uh, what happened is that um, um, uh, people's mistaking the assumption is that Tibetan Buddhism is Buddhism, and it's not. It's basically a Gnostic form of Buddhism. So this is the ideology that uh, the Nazis followed. Uh, most importantly, it is the belief that the use of psychedelic drugs uh, allow the mystic to achieve contact with uh, disembodied entities or the spirit world as it's referred to. And so all modern scholarship on the subject, which has been influenced by these ideas, have assumed that throughout ancient times, the ancient mysteries used drugs to contact the spirit world. And that's where Aldous Huxley got his idea and how he wrote The Brave New World. And that's how that entire concept became the basis of MKUltra and the promotion of the use of LSD. And, they, and then through that, the burgeoning influence of uh, Buddhism in particular and most of the Eastern traditions that have become the basis of the New Age movement. And then out of that, uh, in what's called neo shamanism is where transhumanism emerges from, along with the influence of Scorpionism. Amazing. And I got to say, our audio is bad and we're going to have to end it here. But I want the folks to know and think about this, that Hitler ran around carrying books titled ISIS Unveiled. Uh, you know, it's not a new thing. This is something that has been in this culture of the Illuminati for centuries, if not millennia as it carries forward in, uh, through all of the media streams from comic books, to child programming, and of course the children are what they consider their agents of change, and that, that's why they are targeted with science fiction and how all of this gets wrapped up into a satanic belief system that is leading us straight to transhumanism. So as we pick this up on the other side, we're going to continue to look into the LSD culture, taking this to the Unabomber and start to understand maybe, just maybe, he was on the right track uh, in seeking out the destruction of the Internet. So when we return, we're going to get deep into transhumanism. My guest tonight is David Livingstone. His website conspiracyschool.com and you can definitely pick up all his books there i'll have them linked right here for you at freemantv.com and check out the works of transhumanism check out the works on islam and all of his you, you how many books do you have now david uh, five five that's what i thought yes a very very knowledgeable man his name is david livingstone conspiracyschool.com so if you're not a member yet Go ahead and sign up. Join on the team and, and come with us on this wild ride. Uh, I need you. I love you. And I'll do everything I can to help guide you into this uh, future with a happy face as far as I can. Uh, so please uh, think about subscribing to FreemanTV.com to help us move into the future. It's, it's simple. It's easy. Just go over to FreemanTV.com and hit subscribe. There's many ways and options for you there. And it's, uh, you know, it helps everyone. So thank you all so much for tuning in. I apologize for all the audio issues we had, 
But, um, you know, we got to get this message out no matter how difficult it is. So thank you, and we will see you next week. Members, join us over in the members section as we get deep into transhumanism.